Kia ora, g'day and welcome to the history of Aotearoa New Zealand, episode 39, Slice of Heaven. This podcast is supported by our amazing patrons. If you want to support Hans, go to patreon.com slash history Aotearoa. Last time, we covered the story of Barnett Burns, an English trader who came to New Zealand seeking a new life. Before that, we had our series on tāmoko, Māori tattooing. This time, we'll be starting a new set of episodes on taonga puro, Māori musical instruments. We'll talk about all the various different instruments themselves, how they were played, and what situations they were played, and all that good stuff. As this is a podcast, a specifically audio format, I won't have to try too hard in describing what these sounded like. Instead, I will of course be giving you a taster of the voice of each instrument. That is also how I will be referring to each instrument from now on. We have talked, and will continue talking, about Te Ao Māori, essentially translated as the Māori world, part of which is how the world is viewed through a Māori lens. Something I found really fascinating while researching Taonga Puro is how Te Ao Māori was applied to them, in the sense that they didn't often refer to the sound that the instruments made. They talked about the voice it had, or in some cases, the multiple voices, more in the sense that it's a living, breathing thing. So we will be following their example and talk about the voices of these instruments that were used to communicate with the land, the birds, and tūpuna, ancestors. To start with, let's talk about what Europeans thought of Taonga Puro. And I can hear you all groaning from here and I get it, I feel your pain, because we all know how this is going to go down. That's why I'm putting it here at the start so that we can get it out of the way, but it is still a perspective that is valuable and should at least be noted. So as you've probably guessed, Europeans almost universally hated the melodies coming from Māori instruments. Alston Best describes numerous instances of people's complaints of instruments making a quote, shrill horse sound, end quote, or quote, a most horrid noise, end quote, or quote, a hideous bellowing, end quote, or quote, entirely discordant, if not absolutely hideous, to a European ear, end quote. You get the idea. He also talks about someone who said of one instrument, quote, they produce a sound similar to the sound of bagpipes, end quote. Best refutes this, however, saying, quote, I would say that nothing is less like that of the bagpipes, end quote. As someone who goddamn loves the bagpipes, I can't really decide if either of these are meant to be insults or compliments. Now that we have passed that unpleasantness, let's get on to what we're really here for. Taonga puro mostly consist of wind instruments, and a few percussion ones, with only a single string instrument. The original plan was to cover each instrument based on the musical group it fits into, to kind of make sure that there was some sort of order to all these episodes. However, I want to stay more in keeping with the Te Ao Māori perspective with this. So instead of using the Western or Pākehā grouping system, I'll use a more Māori one, which tends to group the instruments based on the atua, god, that they come from. So the instruments that call to birds in the forest are grouped under Tāne Mahuta, god of the forest. Instruments that use shells are of Tangaroa, god of the sea. The flutes are grouped under Raukatori, goddess of flutes, with the other instruments that are blown into coming under Tāwhirimātea, god of wind and storms. Gourd instruments are put under Hine Pū Te Hue, goddess of gourds, And finally, instruments that are to do with the setting of rhythm are in the family of Papatuanuku, the Earth Mother. Please note that this grouping system does not necessarily reflect the views of Māori of the time, or even today. Let's start then with those instruments that come under Tāne Mahuta. Separator of Rangi and Papa, maker of the first woman, father of birds, trees, and mighty Atua of the forest. Ooh, that's neat. Karanga Manu are bird callers that were used for a few different purposes than the obvious one you might be thinking of. They fit easily in the palm of the hand and can be played with just a couple of fingers, being basically a small bell-looking object with the blowy end being small and the noisy end being big. 
Karanga Manu were made mostly from rock, such as sandstone, soapstone, and perhaps ponamu, which may initially indicate that they wouldn't be part of Tane's domain if it wasn't for the bird calling. What truly muddies the water here, though, is that a subset of Karanga Manu were the Pui A Fio Fio, which was made from a hollowed out gourd with two holes drilled into it on each side. A cord would then be pulled lengthways through the neck and sometimes feathers attached near the larger holes. The idea potentially being that as the Pui A Fio Fio was swung around, as that's how it was played, the feathers would baffle the ear around the holes and change the sound, or perhaps to attract birds visually. Being made of a gourd, but used to attract birds, makes this Taonga Puro sit squarely in both Tane's realm as well as Hine Pu Tehue's realm, goddess of gourds. Although, since they were swung around to make the sounds of the winds, they were also said to come under Tafirimatea as well. Because, you know, when you're talking about culture and anthropology, nothing is ever too straightforward. So keep that in mind going forward that when I say an instrument is in a certain realm or category, that is always a bit fluid depending on your interpretation. What the Karanga Manu were used for was attracting birds to catch for either as pets or to eat, which was done by mimicking their calls. The Pui A Fio Fio was used to catch Kiridu in particular, but it was also used in rituals for the start of the hunting season, particularly by Tuhoi. Though a source from Nā Te Kahununu said in one of the books I read that it may also be used to attract a lover. If you are somewhat familiar with the origin story of this iwi, that may come as no surprise. One of the other reasons Māori used these was to commune with the birds and the wider forest. This is a running theme that we will encounter in that Taonga Puro are thought of as the objects through which the gods, spirits and ancestors can be communicated to. In the case of Karanga Manu, the birds were said to give advice and wisdom from Tane, or that person's tipuna, as well as other tidbits. Another subset of these was the Karanga Weka. No points for getting what this was used for. This instrument mimics the Weka call to attract them, though it is noted that its effectiveness changes depending on the region, with the instrument needing to be adjusted for local quote-unquote dialects that the Weka have. As far as I can tell, there aren't any surviving Karanga Manu from the pre-European period, another theme that we will encounter often. However, there is one Karanga Weka made of soapstone that is held by the British Museum, the only example of its kind. So what do these sound like? Well, here you are. Leaves, reeds, and other such floral items were also used to imitate bird calls for various reasons, these instruments being called tuaroria. The leaves of karamu and papauma, a shrub and broadleaf tree respectively, were favoured to be folded and blown. Although this obviously changed depending on where you lived and what plants and birds were available in your area. The leaves would be folded along the centre rib and held at both ends by the thumb and index finger, which would create a tunnel and then blown into. You could then change the pitch by increasing or releasing tension on the leaf, which would often have a reedy kind of voice. Other plants that could be used were harakeke, kiakia, and ti kouka. Hopefully all plants you are somewhat familiar with now. Some of these leaves would be too waxy to blow into, so instead they would be drawn across each other to create alarm calls, which was apparently quite effective for weka or for scaring off other species. A source that I read also gave an example of some hunters on the Whanganui River, who would cut a clump of reeds, hold them in their hand and make bird calls with them, before discarding them. There was also another instrument that was used to catch kiwi, specifically. It's called by a few different names depending on what region you are talking about, such as Kākara by Tūhoi and Te Arawa, Tātara in Whanganui, Rore by Tainui, and Pātete in the South Island. What it was is a kind of rattle made by weaving a flax collar with either hardwood or bone cylinders hanging off, which would obviously make a bit of noise, particularly when the collar was put on a dog. 
there isn't really any information on why this worked. That seems to have been lost partially because there isn't any historical examples. But the thinking goes that perhaps it sounded like worms or insects moving in the leaf litter, which Kiwi would want to eat. It would also be helpful for the hunter as well, as Kiwi are nocturnal and would be hunted in the dark, so it was an easy way for the hunter to keep track of where the dog was. Unfortunately, I was unable to find a clip of the Tuaroria, but you can see it in action if you watch episode 5 of Artifact, a short series on Māori TV that I would highly recommend. The last few instruments we have talked about are what Brian Flintoff calls Songs of the Birds, presumably as that is the inspiration for those instruments and generally what they are trying to imitate. The next few instruments are what he calls Songs of the Insects, as they likely take their inspiration from and try to imitate the sounds of insects, though they still come under Tane's domain, as insects are found in forests, along with these instruments still being used to communicate with birds. The Roria is an interesting little instrument that is kind of similar to the Jews harp, if you're familiar with that. If not, the Roria is an instrument that sort of looks like a comb, but with just one flat tongue sticking out. I'll put a picture up on historyaotearoa.com under this episode if you want to have a look. They are often made out of manuka, supplejack wood, or sometimes whalebone. The way it was played was by holding the wider base in one hand and putting the long tongue next to your open mouth in parallel. The tongue would then be struck, flipped, or pressed on so that it would wobble and vibrate, with the open mouth acting as a resonator. The mouth could then be opened or closed to change the voice of the instrument. By this action, the player could also speak words or karakia and sing or hum as they played, which was done both for entertainment as well as also speaking with the spirits. It was also said that playing it could relieve the tension in the fingers after a day's weaving. Once Europeans arrived, the roria fell into disuse as the metal jews harp was presented to them. Māori seem to have been really keen on the harp, more so than any other European instrument, likely because it already resembled something that they were familiar with, as opposed to, say, drums or the violin. In fact, they thought it was so cool that boxes filled with harps were provided as payment for blocks of land, along with the usual items. The tongue of these metal juice harps or roria would sometimes be covered in wax, which would give the instrument a slightly gentler voice. Although pretty much all taonga puaro would be considered wind or percussion instruments in the western view, there is one, just one, string instrument, taku. These were essentially small versions of a bow that you would see an archer in other cultures wielding. It makes for an interesting thought as to why Māori found it useful as a musical instrument and not a weapon of war. In fact, never really making that link at all, instead perhaps taking this idea and applying it to cutting down trees, if you remember back to the carving episodes. We don't know a huge amount about how it was played, but we do know that they were played close to the mouth, similar to the roria, and that the string was struck with a striker, or the fingers. Again, like the roria, they were often made of supplejack or whalebone, though we don't know what the string itself was made of, as no historical examples have survived. But if I had to take a stab, it possibly could have been harakeke or something similar. Let's move away now from the realm of Tane Mahuta and his forest, and head into the realm of his brother, Tangaroa, Lord of the Ocean. Unlike the instruments that come under Tane's influence, Tangaroas weren't used to speak to the fish and dolphins, it was more to do with what they were made of, namely, shells. And in the case of the Pūtātara, they were large triton shells of the Triton Australis. The thing about these shells in particular though, is that they weren't native to Aotearoa, so they were actually very difficult to come by. Either they had to be brought over when Māori first arrived, or they had to be collected when they washed up on the beach, 
mostly in the North Island. As a result, Apu Tatara was highly prized, and often passed down through the generations, with some being given names, which wasn't uncommon for instruments that were rare or of great significance. For example, the two Pu Tatara in some versions of the creation story were made after Tane returned with the three Kite of Knowledge, and named Puaro Rangi and Te Farara o Te Rangi. There is also Awa Atiatua, a Pu Tatara from Tufaritoa, which was used to announce the birth of a high-ranked child. Due to this high importance, they were often targeted as key items for looting for their practical, spiritual, and symbolic power. Even as recently as the 1980s, Putatara have been recognised for their symbolic power, when a group led by Tame Eti, a well-known Tuhoi activist, protested a plan by a timber company to plant trees in an important historical site. During the course of this protest, police confiscated his Putatara. We'll talk a bit more about what these instruments were used for in a bit, but you're probably screaming at your phone or computer for me to tell you what the hell they are. So. Let's get on with that next. Putatara was sometimes called war trumpets, though that really only encompasses part of what they did, but essentially they were a form of trumpet, of which Māori had a couple. As we mentioned before, they were made from large triton shells, although they could also be made from the slightly smaller shells from, and here comes a badly pronounced scientific name, Sharona lampus rubicunda, which is a native sea snail so the shells were a bit more readily available. Now, using shells as trumpets isn't a uniquely Māori thing. They are used all over the Pacific, and even the world, but the thing that makes Pūtātara truly unique is that the narrower end of the shell would be cut off or sanded off, and a wooden tube that would act as a mouthpiece added. These seem to have been added mostly to smaller shells to deepen their voice, with the larger shells just having a hole put into the side that would be blown into. These mouthpieces were sometimes extensively carved as well, as we will find with many other taonga puro as we go forward. Another modification they would sometimes have is a kind of patch of wood over the main hole of the shell, which would change the voice of the instrument. This bringing together of wood and shell also has a bit of a symbolic meaning, of bringing Tane and Tangaroa together, arguably the two most important gods in the Māori pantheon. Piango is sometimes used to tie the various parts of the Pūtātara together, which symbolises peace, which stems from a story involving the two Atua and the personification of Sansej. Another way that the voice could be altered was that a poi-like object could be put into the opening of the shell, which would muffle it a bit more. Again, this is a bit of a uniquely Māori thing, as in other areas of the Pacific, the hand would be used for this purpose. Pinning down what Pūtātara sounded like is actually slightly more difficult than you might imagine, and is tied a little into what they were used for. I know I said I wasn't going to mention Europeans' opinions again, but just quickly, this instrument divided them up a bit. Some said it gave a quote, rude noise, end quote, or a quote, hideous bellowing, end quote. However, Abel Tasman himself said of it, quote, they draw from it five or six sounds similar and as sweet as that of the piccolo. These natives evidently have a taste for music, end quote. Are you picking up what they're putting down? What these quotes seem to indicate is that the Pūtātara has a few different voices, some that are more bold, and others that are perhaps more subtle. How this ties into their use is that each one had its own unique sound, or at least unique enough that it could be distinguished from another. So a party that were announcing their arrival with a Pūtātara could be easily identified just by the voice of the instrument, if it was known to tangata whenua. Other uses include announcing a death in the Uruera, as well as being played at a tangihanga, and the followers of Ruake Nana, a Māori prophet born in 1869, regulated their day-to-day -day activities such as lighting fires, emptying ovens, and calling people to dinner. Pū tātara were also used to announce to people foraging on the beaches that there were sharks by giving off a few short blasts. Eventually, cow horns were used for similar purposes after the arrival of Europeans. In more modern usage, although still likely able to be traced back to other Pacific cultures, players will sometimes join a waka in play. Mm -hmm. 
few more instruments that we will talk about from the domain of Tangaroa. But that is where we will leave it for today so we can talk about them properly and don't run out of time. So, next time, we will continue our discussions on Taonga Puro, Māori musical instruments, discussing what they looked like, what they were used for, and other interesting quirks we can find, along with, of course, giving you a taste of what they sound like. If you want to send me feedback, ask a question, suggest a topic, or just have a chinwag, you can reach me through email at historyaltearoa at gmail.com or Twitter at historyaltearoa or Facebook at History Aotearoa New Zealand Podcast. Aotearoa spelt A-O-T-E-A-R-O-A. This podcast is a one-man band. If you enjoy listening to me talk history, you can support us through Patreon, buy merch from historyaltearoa.com, or rate us on iTunes or your preferred podcast platform. It means a lot and helps us grow, spreading the story of Aotearoa New Zealand. As always, haritu atu, hoki tu mai. See you next time.